you know, in our prep call, we talked about this concept of uh, secure multi-party computation and access to private data through encryption and essentially being able to access data for purposes of you know, alpha signals that otherwise would have been considered too sensitive, too private, not disclosable, um, which, which to me sounded like you know, that could be sort of a treasure trove of new data that could be uncovered uh, with that approach. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what you're doing in that space and what you think the potential is and how far along you are and you know, how far along you think the industry is because uh, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of a fascinating new, new topic. Thanks, Ruben. Uh, this is something I could talk about quite a bit. <laughs> um, so in, in a world where most data that's being used by investors is becoming more and more commoditized and is being kind of priced into the markets, investors are really looking for what are going to be new, unique data sources that others don't have access to. No matter how much you're looking at commercial data markets and acquiring new data sources, the alpha that you can generate from those data sources will eventually decay as others start to use it as well. What we've been exploring is how can you use technology, so specifically SMPC and other forms of kind of encryption and cryptography, to enable access to derive insights from new data sources. So companies that have treasure troves of data that they're not comfortable selling right now, whether it's for commercial reasons, for privacy reasons, for reputational reasons, you can use this technology to actually uh, train and, and run your models on data sources that would otherwise be inaccessible. Now, if you think about the way that privacy regulations are starting to expand, uh, and we're moving in North America a little bit closer to some of the regulations you, you might see in Europe, like GDPR, there is actually more interest in protecting security of data while also uh, enabling insight. So what we've done is actually partner with a company in the SNPC space, a company called uh, Infer, to try and build a, a network of data providers uh, that otherwise would not be able to monetize their data um, and use that to feed into our models. It's very early, honestly, in the asset management space. Um, we've seen a lot of traction in this space when it comes to healthcare data uh, and, and banking use cases, where there's really incentive to share data with your peers uh, for things like better patient outcomes or even uh, anti-fraud models. But for asset managers, where everyone's a little bit more protective of their models, of their data, it's harder to align incentives. Um, and so I think it's a little bit earlier stage for us, but we're hoping to be at the forefront of that. Great. Is that something anybody else is seeing at, at, at Fidelity, anywhere else? There's this uh, you know, secure multi-party computation approach to private data. I mean, we are aware of partners that do this, like Triple Blind. Um, they've, they're you know, at all the same conferences and working with our customers. Um, mm. We have a lot of customers in the healthcare space, not just in finance. Um, so it is certainly a, a, a use case for them. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to come back to it in a, in a second. But, but before that, I, I want to introduce another sort of um, topic or concern, if you will, which is, you know, as, as probably you all know, App Annie had this enforcement action against them last year uh, by the SEC because they were using data that wasn't fully disclosed as, as, as the data that it actually was, right? And so alternative data providers are becoming, you know, they're facing more scrutiny now and, and due diligence requirements are increasing and, you know, they're, they're maybe they have to have a certain scale to have a, a you know, a legal counsel on board and so forth. It, is that something that that yours is that something that's changing the market for how alternative data is provided and and consumed and what it, what's the sort of repercussions of that that you've seen so far if if any why don't we start with you Sarah Yeah I mean Sequentum Sequentum has worked uh, over 18 months on compliance uh, guidelines we published uh, under the Alt Data Council um, with FISD the Financial Information Standards Division under SIA. Um, guidelines on how to operate a web data operation with compliance. And we think quite a bit about how to um, operate in this unregulated space um, in, a, in a governed way um, and in a way that, you know, SEC governed institutions can really align around. Um, the interesting thing for us as a data vendor, um, you know, in the wake of the App Annie decision was that uh, data vendors are indeed SEC governed, right? It was, you know, in 2018, 2019, 
um, you know, in, dis in discussing, you know, contracts with uh, compliance teams of SEC governed firms, um, they would always say, well, you're not SEC governed, um, so you're, you carry less risk. But apparently we're SEC governed, and that's quite clear now. The issue with App Annie um, was that they, <clears throat> they had two sides to their business. Right? They had the side of the business that, where they ran models on aggregated data, and it was supposed to be anonymized aggregated data, an automated machine learning process that spit out certain forecasts. But in trying to get those models to work well, they looked at their other side of the business, which was actual real company data, um, which was material non-public information. And they used that to inform their models. And so their models were you know, remarkably accurate. Um, and so the firms that were trading on that data were, technically you could say it was insider trading, but because they had gone through a very concrete, um, responsible due diligence process, they expected it to be aggregated, anonymized um, uh, answers being spit out, and it wasn't. So in, in that case, again, from Sequentum's point of view, we're laser focused on compliance, we're constantly building improvements uh, in our platform to make sure that we have uh, compliant and governable operation. One of the things that we focus on is not just establishing operating guidelines that are auditable, but providing the transparency to all the teams who are stakeholders in making sure that that operation is working the way it needs to, right? So we automatically document every automation routine. We call them agents. Um, they're automatically documented. You can see all the version history. You can see, you know, all the schedules and deployments, what went where, who had access, who made what change when, right? And then at any time that there is an issue associated with an agent, there's a ticketing system and there are issues tracked. Um, and this is all, you know, transparent. And there's controls, right? There's things like rate limits and there's an approval process. Um, you know, there's a compliance role someone can um, you know, control what's allowed and not allowed to run. Um, you know, and these are all what we think of as, as best practices. Obviously, this is an unregulated unre space. We're getting more and more decisions, like the HiQ LinkedIn decision um, went the way we expected it to, right? Web scraping is not um, uh, something that is uh, hacking under the CFAA. That was an important um, decision uh, to reach. Um, web scraping is not on its own illegal, right? There are things that you can do during web scraping that can get you into trouble. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think App Annie was, uh, uh, you know, made it clear that, that data vendors are also SEC governed right. and need to take compliance very seriously. Right, right. And that fidelity, has, has things changed since the App Annie decision with respect to how you engage with alternative data vendors? Um, first off, I should mention that uh, uh, these comments are all my own and, and not right. those of my employer, but um, I would say we've seen maturation in the space where a lot of firms, you know, weren't, um, that this is some kind of exhaust data that they started selling to this industry and were a bit surprised by the types of questions and the intensity of questions that they would get from um, um, companies in the, the financial sector. And I think now there's a much greater understanding that that is a large part of the process. And so I, I think it, it's been um, in many ways a good thing that vendors are now um, more familiar with this process. They expect it, they're more receptive to it. And I think that that's just the, the outgrowth um, of this industry maturing. Right. And at Revelio, are you, or did you have to change your processes, or are you? Or do you see this as a maybe as an advantage even because you're sort of a, a you know bigger vendor and therefore you have the scale to have compliance covered by dedicated folks and that sort of thing? It's a really interesting question. I mean, in some ways, we are the beneficiaries of some of these rulings. Like you mentioned, the High Q LinkedIn case, that was a really positive um, ruling. Um, there were actually two things that were that were really great there. I mean, number one is that is that the courts found that if you are not logging into a website, you are not bound by a site's terms of service. You're not bound by robots.txt. You know, the, any data that you can see on an incognito browser is public information. 
Uh, another thing they found, which was interesting, is that circumventing or even solving CAPTCHAs is not an issue. And that was, that was a bit of a gray area because you technically are misrepresenting yourself. And for information that you gather through misrepresentation, you know, are you allowed to sell that? Turns out you can. So, so circumventing solving CAPTCHAs was, was another thing that came out of that ruling, which was very positive. Um, but I think, I think the fact that we've gotten clarity on the legality of web scraping has, has sort of incentivized um, target, uh, target websites to increase their, the speed bumps in their process. So it's become more costly to web scrape. And I think it is a barrier to entry. I think the fact that we're, we're you know, a big, a big alternative data provider is an advantage. You know, if, if I'm thinking, um, you know, if we could afford the costs that we're spending now, you know, three, four years ago, there's no way. I think, I think it's not a good environment for new, new alternative data entrance, which is unfortunate. 